Yeah, hello. Could you do a short presentation of yourself and why you are here today? Um, I'm the president of the Council of Georgist Organizations and director of a group called Saving Communities and uh, mostly here to speak about land value tax and land trusts. Um, land value tax is like property tax except that the assessor figures out the value of the building and the value of the land under it. And what we propose is you keep reducing the rates on the building and increasing the rates on the land until it's very expensive to hold vacant land in a prime location, but it's very inexpensive to have an improvement, to make an improvement to the land. Uh, why should Swedish investors invest in community land trusts, and how would that, and how would that benefit so so society as a whole? Well, it's if it's um, if it's done right, a land trust can be very profitable because the the landlord only takes a fraction of the rent, but a fraction of the rent in a thriving community is more than all of the rent in a stagnant community. So if you go to a little place in the middle of a farming area and you can create a little t a little village in the center that can buy the local produce and the land trust, the, the investors only get maybe a fourth of the rent, but it's a fourth of village rent, where if they didn't do this, it would have just been a farm. Or if it's in a very poor neighborhood that's got no employment and they, they do this, then they, they get a fourth of the rent, but it quickly becomes a thriving community, and a fourth of the rent in that thriving community is still more than all of the rent in a community that's struggling. Uh, could local governments own land trusts as well? In the United States, they probably could not. But I, I don't know. Sweden is, is very different in so many ways. Um, the, the concern is there's a lot of political pressure to not collect the full rent. And if you don't collect the full rent, the leaseholder will then sell the lease and it ends up being just like the current system where the land gets so expensive that people can't afford to buy a piece. And the leaseholder, just like if you don't collect a lot of property tax, the price of the property goes up. And if you don't collect enough of the rent, then the leaseholder will collect the rent from the next leaseholder. So in the long run, it's better to collect the full rent and then use the money to help the leaseholders by rebating their taxes or providing uh, community services. You did a tax reform in Pittsburgh. Could you tell us what that was and what it was and what it did for the and what it did for the city? Well, the first reform was in 1913, and they they shifted to raise the rates on land, like I was saying. And before that, Pittsburgh was the second most expensive city in the entire United States. New York City was first, and Pittsburgh was second. And this was, even though it was an industrial town, very dirty and smoky, there was, the land was so monopolized that people had to pay a lot of money to live there. And after the, after the land value tax started to take effect, Pittsburgh land prices did not go up, but the rest of the country did. So we became, over time, the most affordable city. And even after we cleaned up and got rid of all the pollution, we were the most affordable city because nobody was speculating on Pittsburgh land. Um, this lasted till 2000, and the county messed up the assessments, and they, they're fighting to get the assessments straightened out so they can go back to land value tax. But all that time, in the Great Depression, Pittsburgh never had a housing collapse because they never had a bubble in the first place. And in the 1970s, when the steel industry collapsed, Pittsburgh actually had a construction surge because the city council increased the land value tax just as the mills were shutting down. And what happened was all of the vacant property just immediately turned over and new people started doing things with it. Uh, do you think that Sweden should try the same tax reform? In that case, why? What could it mean for Sweden? 
Well, it should work anywhere. Um, it's been done in Australia. It was done in Denmark, and they had great prosperity around 1950. But then the landowners didn't like it, and they persuaded homeowners that their house value would not go up, which is true. Uh, but it means that if you can't sell your house for more, it's because your children don't have to pay more. So it's, why is it a bad thing for you as an ordinary person with, with an ordinary family? Why is it good for you that your house value goes up, but your children's house prices that they have to pay also goes up? But um, they appealed to that and they got it overturned. Denmark is not much like the United States, but it's more like, more like Sweden. So. And you call, you call yourself a libertarian. What is that? Well, in the United States, libertarians are mostly right wing. And they believe that there should be no very little government, very little restrictions. But they believe in certain privileges. And the land title is one of those privileges that you have land not because you produced the land, God or nature produced the land but because the, the state gave you a piece of paper saying this is your land. And the original libertarians, the classical liberals, to them, um, fr the free market was a market free of privilege. And that's what the geo-libertarians believe. The right-wing libertarians believe that a free market is a market that is free of any restraints on privilege. So privilege runs rampant uh, in their their worldview, and they think that's good. Um, I've heard about neoclassical economics, Keynesian economics, and Marxist. Uh, Keynesian. Uh, Keynesian. Uh, but never geoclassical economics. What, what are the differences? Well, ours is based on the original classical economics of Adam Smith and John Locke. Um, and the, and the parts of it that they, that other people have learned to not see. So um, we have, um, we have uh, in Adam Smith, he says land, land is the best thing to tax. Uh, John Locke may, went to great lengths to say that you have a right to take up land only if there is enough land for others and land that is generally is good for others. And if you take the best land, then you owe the community a rent. And he said that if you tax anything other than land, it will destroy land value anyhow, so it's smarter for the landlord to pay it. So that's the original classicals. Um, Turgot and Kinney, the people who gave us um, the term laissez-faire, they also advocated that land should be the only thing taxed. So that's kind of been lost. So we go back to the classical economics. And the only thing is our focus is the things that other people have ignored. And for the last question, how could universities use the information you gave us at the presentation? Do we need more research in this economic field? Yes, uh, because there's many myths about it. Uh, there's the myth that property tax is regressive and that land tax, they don't think about land tax, but even property tax is not regressive. It, if you look at what a person in a municipality pays under property tax for every million dollars raised, and then you look at what he would pay under a wage tax or an income tax or a sales tax. Property tax is always the cheapest for most homeowners. And the exception is in the richest neighborhoods. Um, land value tax is cheaper than property tax in the poorer neighborhoods, in the middle income neighborhoods. But in the most prestigious neighborhood where everybody wants to live and the land value is very high, they actually pay more sometimes under land value tax. But that's, it's an easy research to do. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.